Coming up on Unscripted Faith, wouldn't it be amazing if you could have a living encounter with God anytime you wanted? Terry Copeland Pearson believes you can, and her insight has the power to help transform your prayer life. Yes, I want that. And how do you know if God's calling for your life is to lead others? Doug Smith from Light of Life and Elderly Leadership joins us to share his story and how God is leading him to lead others. Unscripted Faith starts right now. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Unscripted Faith. We are so excited you've invited us into wherever you are, and I'm excited about our guests here today. We've yes. got a homegrown guy, and then we also have a nationally known individual that's going to be outstanding. Yes, let's get into it. I want to know how we can always have that continual presence of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> it's going to be so exciting. Well, listen, our guest, Terry Copeland Pearsons, is a person that she wants nothing more than for everyone to have a relationship with the Lord. And one of the ways we can experience that intimacy with God is through prayer. Terry, it is so good to have you with us on Unscripted Faith. Hey, thank you so much. It's good to see you both. Terry, okay, go ahead. we are honored. We are honored. Terry Copeland, we hear that name and we just think legacy and, and power and fire. Now, you have to tell us because having a pastor as a, as a father, was that always how, what, how was that being a PK? Well, I like growing up in, in the atmosphere, as my son calls it, the household of faith. <laughs> I, I like that. I, I latched onto that really early on and found that even as a, a really young, young person, that faith would work for me. So who would want to walk away from that? You know, because when you, when you see the word of God at work in somebody's life, not just on the platform or in a ministry or in other kinds of situations public, but when you see it working 24-7 uh, and it's real and it's alive, who wouldn't want that? So thank God. So you didn't have any issues struggling with your faith, maybe coming up, you know, maybe being a PK or, uh, you know, I mean, under the spotlight of your dad, were there any issues along that you uh, like that that you might have had? Well, no, not really so much. Um, you know, he, he didn't actually go into ministry till I was 10. So I already had a, a firm footing thanks to my grandmother who saw to that. Uh, even before my dad was saved, she saw to it that I knew, I didn't just know about Jesus, but she had me walking and talking with Jesus from as far back literally as I can remember. Wow. It was Jesus, it was Literally, Jesus in the morning, Jesus at noontime, Jesus when the sun went down, and Jesus all night long. <laughs> she, she, she prayed in her sleep. She prayed in tongues in her sleep. And I slept right next to her till I was about 12 wow. whenever I was with her. And she literally would snore going in and <laughs> tongues going out. So <laughs> Jesus was uh, alive and real and a part of every minute, really, of every day. Wow. So I was grounded with Jesus even before my dad was saved. That is so powerful that you got to be a part of praying your father into the kingdom. That is your foundation wow. of faith. Tell us a little bit about some of those encounters, maybe as a young girl or as a teenager, that were significant for you in establishing and rooting you in knowing that God is very present and very real. I'm sorry, guys, I have no audio again. I didn't hear a thing you said, Angela. Oh, that's okay, no problem at all. No, there you are. There we go. I got we're back. You. We're back. <laughs> unscripted. You're back. Totally right. unscripted. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. He's coming through the main line, right? <laughs> I apologize. It just your lips were moving. <laughs> <laughs> just I was just asking, was there a moment, or maybe several, but you'd like to share one moment as a young girl encountering the real tangible presence of Jesus? Well, there were so many things that happened in my childhood most all of them connected, and I say early childhood, earliest, that they were all connected somehow, um, mostly with my grandmother, 
and of course my grandfather, but she was the more outspoken one. Mm -hmm. And just that, that knowing him, that, I mean, she, literally she took me to the mat, <laughs> to the floor and praying for my dad. She said, Terry Lynn, we have to pray for your daddy to get saved. Wow. And so that's what we did. That was our focus when we, when we actually took the time to, to pray, but there was so much just conversation with Jesus and singing about Jesus and talking about Jesus. And then I saw the power of that in her life. And then I started seeing it in my own life. I had encounters with him that I can think back on as early real encounters with him at the earliest four years old, five years old. I, I remember suddenly being in prayer for my dad. She wasn't even with me, but in her house and in prayer for my dad down on, on the floor uh, makes me want to cry now. And I think about it and rolling under the coffee table and crying and praying mm. for him. Mm. And so uh, things like that. And then other kinds of special visitations from the Lord at six years old and eight years old. And those are wonderful, but it was that every day awareness of him that really was the guide in my life. Not, not so much big encounters. Those are wonderful and I treasure them, but it was that, that always no, and there were times when I, as I got older, I remember an extremely difficult time in my life as an adult, extremely. But, you know, I thank God for my training. Yeah. And my training said, he'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. So I would say to him, it doesn't feel like you're close. It doesn't feel like you're nearby. But your word says you'll never leave me. Your word says you're not those of a broken heart. And so Jesus helped me out of this. And he did. He wow. did. Well, Terry, did. Uh, what can somebody do? I've seen encounters. We were here you mentioning the different encounters that you've had. What did you do or what can we do to perpetuate, to have and position ourselves to have an encounter with him? Well, it's awareness, I think, is such a, a big word. And there are two, two primary ways to focus on that. One, of course, is the word. Jesus is the living word, and he is revealed in his word. God is revealed in his word. The Holy Spirit is revealed. Faith is revealed. It's all in his word. And you really aren't going to know him truly if you don't look for him in the word. But if you try to go to the word without being aware of a relationship in his presence, then it just it gets hard and dry. And there are people that know the Bible that don't really know him. Being aware that you are a spirit being, you're in the image of God, meaning God is a spirit, you are a spirit, you know, that's who you are with this outer outer outfit mm -hmm. called our body. Uh, but knowing that and quit looking for him on the outside and quit looking for him with these ears, but learning how to, uh, Clark Taylor said one time, drop down into Jesus. I tell my Bible school students, uh, we have a Bible school here, and I tell them, Proverbs 20, 27, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts, P-A-R-T-S, of the belly. You have parts on the inside, and that's where God lights himself up. That's where he reveals himself. And so not trying to just talk to Jesus in my head, but I'm looking down on the inside. If you're born again, the Holy Spirit is there, and he is the divine communicator. He's the divine connector. He says what he hears from the Father. He says what he hears from Jesus. And by, by the Holy Spirit within, he hears us. And it just drop down into him and be aware of him. Sometimes just practicing being aware that he's right here so that when I read his words, his presence is here. It's also here. Oh, when those two things come together. Wow. Pardon me if I just start teaching. I can't help it. I'm alone. Go on and teach. We're here for it. <laughs> 
Now you have a book and that book, you share some of these encounters with Jesus and your grandmother and her influence in, in your life. Is there anything that as you go on your day-to-day -day journey with Jesus, is there anything that you continue to find yourself remembering or revisiting to bring you present in him? You know, funny you should ask, just this morning, we, we had what she called little ditties. And those were little Sunday school songs, you know, back in the day, our little Baptist hymns that we sang that I love so much. Oh, the blood. Mm -hmm. Oh, how I love Jesus. Yes. Is J Jesus is so wonderful. And, and those little songs, we sang them. And so I sang them all the time and, and just by myself. And we have more time. I could tell you some of the marvelous things that came out of that, but um, that's part of what's in the book. But um, it just this morning, one of those little songs came up to me. Just the... Um, Oh, how I love Jesus. Yeah. And it's just simple. But all of a sudden, that same presence that I can remember wow. from over 60 years ago um, it fills, fills me up because I really do love him. And to sing to him in that simplicity, mm. uh, there's a lot more to prayer than just that. But without that, everything else is just hard work. Yeah. But when you have that, everything else in prayer is a marvelous adventure. People need to know how. And so this, my book is not just about the stories. Stories help. Jesus told stories. But there's also, a, I took the time from low these 60-something years, uh, things that I've learned from the Word and help, to help people understand the spiritual laws that govern prayer, but also that relationship side, walking and talking with Jesus. Oh, you're going to get me crying oh. right Come here. On. Right here. <laughs> Come well, on. you know, Terry, it is such an honor and a privilege to have you here today. And what is outstanding to me is the fact that your heart for God still burns bright. Like yes. you said, after 60 years, you're still as in love mm. with him even more so than you were as a little girl. So thank you so much for stopping by here on Unscripted Faith and please come visit us at any time. Hey, this was a delight. Uh, really, thank you so much and God bless you. God bless your viewers. And like we say around here every day, all day, Jesus is Lord. Amen. Love you guys. Amen, God bless you, love you too. Let's now check out this week's Ask Amy as she offers advice for parents who have a certain type of child. Let's take a look at what she has to say. When you mention the word strong-willed child, does this come to mind? Strong, bossy, pushy, too intense, aggressive, overbearing? Have you ever said, she's as stubborn as a mule? Or you might as well give him whatever he wants. He is too headstrong to listen to reason. Have you ever said, my child is so determined they are unwilling to bend or move or change their opinions and beliefs. That's the question for today. Help, I have a strong-willed child. What do I do? I'm glad you asked. There's a great saying that says, if you parent a strong-willed child, it's like two goats fighting on the side of a cliff. <laughs> Here are a few thoughts and scriptures for you. Number one, a strong will is a good thing. You might see it's bad right now, but if you can last through it, then you'll see it's a great thing. Number two, that's the key. You have to outlast that strong will. You've got to be the wall that they hit every time they want to come against you and defy and go against you because you know that that strong will is meant for good. Number three, strong-willed children actually change the world. What a perspective to have. If you could just see past the daily aggressiveness against you and see that that aggression is for to be against evil and for good. Luke 1 says that Jesus grew and became strong in spirit. What about Proverbs 18, 14? The strong spirit of a man will sustain him in bodily pain or trouble, but a weak and broken spirit, 
who can raise up or bear. Let me ask you a question. What if that strong will is for good? What if their hearts belong fiercely to God? What if they're a woman or a man of principle with no excuses? What if they're deeply committed and relentlessly persistent, fiercely loyal? What if they will take on impossible circumstances? You want a strong-willed child when their will is strong for and not against you. When their will is used for the purposes of God, strong-willed children really do change the world. And you ought to know because you are one. We'll see you next week on Ask Abel. thankful for Amy's advice with strong-willed children and maybe you are one of those strong-willed children she is talking about or you have one but God has intended it to serve your life and to serve him to give him all the glory welcome back to unscripted faith we're joined now by Doug Smith from light of life rescue and elderly leadership and believe it or not Doug was once told by someone that he wouldn't be a phenomenal leader but everything changed when he grew up his senior year Doug welcome to unscripted faith and J. It's great to be with you. Great to be with friends. Yeah. Come on. Listen, you are a leader of leaders, Doug. L3 Leadership, Light of Life Rescue Mission. I mean, you're doing pastor minds. Tell us a little bit about what you are doing now and what the Lord has called you to. Yep. Married to my high school sweetheart. We were all just talking, talking beforehand. We're expecting our fifth child. Yes. I said that out loud five. Five. So for pray for us. <laughs> so really, that is where all my leadership efforts are at home. But yeah. uh, married my high school sweetheart, as I mentioned, I work at Light of Life Rescue Mission. We're a nonprofit on the north side of Pittsburgh. Have been serving the men, women, and children of our city uh, that are experiencing homelessness since 1952. So over 70 years in our community, wow. and I help run the day-to-day -day there. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, I'm also very passionate about leadership development. And so I have a leadership podcast, a leadership company. We run mastermind groups uh, with local pastors here, and it's been a wonderful thing. So that's a little bit about me. It's amazing. <laughs> like, you are a leader of leaders, truly, Doug. And I'm honored to know you and your wife as yeah. friends now and in ministry. But you weren't always a leader. Take us back to how Doug was formed and shaped into what God has called you to today. Yeah, yeah, I haven't had an easy life. And, and I would just say that about everyone. You know, we live yes. in a world today where social media makes everyone's lives look like highlight reels. True. But everyone's going, the Bible says that we're all going through tests and trials, right? And so it's so easy to be like, oh, I'm the only one going through something. I'm the only one that has a hard life. Look at Doug or look at Ange, they, their lives are perfect. Not true. Yeah. But yeah, when growing up, if when I tell people my story now, they're like, oh my gosh, I would have never thought that in a million years. Grew up in a pretty normal family life, but unfortunately uh, had my mom get sick with a rare nerve disease when we were in middle school. As a result, she ended up being in bed most of the time. My dad had to work two jobs to get our family by. He was a bus driver and a truck driver. And as a result, as a you know, 13, 14 year old kid, I had no boundaries. So as a 13 year old, it's awesome, right? I was allowed to do whatever I want. Uh, until I started hanging out with the wrong crowd and got into drugs and totally fell away from God. Uh, I had gotten saved in middle school at a camp, felt called to ministry. But a few months into drugs, I wanted nothing to do with that life and basically determined that I would never amount to anything in my life. Stopped trying in school in eighth grade. Uh, had to go to summer school every year just to get to the next grade. Partied. Uh, found out my mom had these pills called Oxycontins, which is basically synthetic heroin. And so I found out there's a market for those in school. And so I would sell those to people. And so I was a drug dealer for many years. And I thought I was living the dream. Uh, but until my senior year, my mom had continued to get sick. Mm -hmm. And in my beginning of my senior year, it was October of 2002, my mom ended up passing away. Uh, now, when she passed away, this was interesting. Uh, I was grieved, but I wasn't grieved in the sense that she went. I was actually relieved because I saw her suffer so much. Mm -hmm. What I was grieving was about was I didn't know if she had a relationship with Christ. And I had no idea why that bothered me. I wanted nothing to do with Christ at the time. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to parties, I'm getting drunk, I'm getting high, trying to deal with this. And every night my head is hitting the pillow and I just hear these words coming to me, you're never going to know. You're going to be 70 years old one day and still being tortured by this fact of not knowing whether or not your mom knew Christ. So three months go by, and one random Saturday morning, I say random, I get a call from a distant relative. I had no relationship with this woman, much older than me. I was 17 years old, and she said, Doug, I feel like the Lord had me call you this morning. He put you on my heart, and he wanted me to tell you that I was a nurse in the hospital with your mom, and I led your mom into a relationship with Christ three weeks before she passed. What? Thank you, yeah. Jesus. And I think God wants you to know that. And I, I, I literally, I mean, my knees hit the floor. I don't remember anything else she said. I started crying and I just put my arms out. I said, God, all right, I'm in. Whatever you want for the rest of my life, I'm all in. 
And uh, two weeks later, randomly, again, got invited to a Bible study uh, at a high school that was led by a mom who just felt led to start a Bible study. 150 kids would go to this. It was bigger than a lot of youth groups, just with a mom with a passion. So I always tell people, man, if God deals with you to do something, do it. You have no idea what's on the other side of it. I don't have time to tell a story, but the mom's daughter, I thought was very, very cute, said, hey, I'm going to Bible study every night. First <laughs> night of, I come home from Bible study, I said, I saw my friends, I said, fellas, I met the girl I'm going to marry, and uh, just because we don't have time, I did call my shot first night, I did end up marrying that girl. Come on, somebody. Uh, but it did take me 10 years, and that was really the start of, of Christ turning my life around, ended up going to Victory Family Church here in Cranberry, interning there, and, uh, and really, that was the start of trajectory to, to get me where I am today. Wow, that is outstanding. And so now, I mean, you're doing big things for the Lord. Let me ask you this question. Uh, why is leadership uh, so important to you? Yeah, because leadership is influence. And so leaders are the ones who influence culture. They influence the world. And so I think when I got saved, what initially, I would say by nature, I would, I would call, consider myself an evangelist. Like I want, I want other people to experience what I've experienced. And so very, very quickly, as I got into the church world, I realized, hey, if you're going to make a big impact, then you need to, to learn how to lead and how to influence others. And fortunately, um, you know, when I share my story, I was actually sharing with a friend the other day, and he said, Doug, how many kids that were in your situation growing up do you think actually got out? Right. And, I, you know, I'm an optimist. I said 50%. And he said, I, I would bet it's more like 5%. Yeah. Yeah. And I started reflecting on that. And two things, like one, people always say, well, how did you get out of that? Number one is God. Obviously, the story I just shared yeah. with you is what turned me life, my life around. But the second thing was leaders coming into my life and taking an interest in me. I had mm -hmm. my father-in-law. He wasn't my father-in-law at the time. But for 10 years, this man invested in my life and showed me another way. Right? If you know kids that are in dire circumstances, they need shown another way of life, and they need models in our community to show them that. He showed me, along with the youth pastor, Larry Betancourt, they showed me what a godly husband looked like. They showed me what a godly dad looked like. They showed me what a godly family looked like. Most people, including myself, only have one model of family their entire life. And so all of a sudden, I had these leaders coming in my life and saying, Doug, you have potential. You, have, you are a leader. You, it, my, my wife told her mom, if this kid gets a hold of God, he can change the world. And so I basically have devoted my life to saying, I want to invest in as many young Dugs as I can and, and have them have the experience that I had. And I hope they go and do unbelievable things and change the world. And so that's really my heart behind why I'm all about leadership development. Because when you influence a leader, you're not just influencing a leader, you're influencing everyone that leader influences. And that's how you can make a huge change in the world. Mm. Wow. I think about your story and how, like you said, a mother had a call from the Lord and that led to your salvation. So many others that is having this trickle down effect and this legacy, a lot like even Terry's story of her yeah. grandmother. Yeah. Doug, what would you say? Go ahead. I was just going to say yeah. also, don't forget, I always throw this out there. Yesterday, we, the girl that invited me to Bible study came over our house yesterday. I haven't seen her in 10 years. And to be able to say thank you, had you not had you not even felt prompted to invite me to a Bible study, I might not be here today. And, and I don't have time to go into this story. I had a younger sister who was going down the same path I did, and she just kept going down the same path after I started going after God. She ends up, unfortunately, a heroin addict. She did dedicate her life to Christ, but we lost her to an overdose in 2019. And, and I share that story because had that not, invitation not happened, had that woman not started that Bible study, it's more likely that I'm someone who's walking through the doors of light of life rather than being someone on the wow. other side serving people coming to light of life. And so if you feel prompt to do anything, invite, start a study, obey God, there's a reason for it, and you have no idea what's on the other side. And that woman also basically had a son-in-law on the other side of that, which is interesting to think about. So anyway, God. obey God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, that right there, like Doug, each one of us can participate in changing the world yes. for one person. Leader, okay, you're a phenomenal leader. What is to you the number one key to being a successful leader? Yeah, for me, I would say the number one thing I'm passionate about is that every leader needs a place where they're fully known, fully loved, and fully challenged. What does that mean? Fully known. You have a place in a community with leaders because leaders isolate themselves. Henry Cloud did a study and 85% of executives that he studied didn't have one single person that they could confide in or be real with. And so when we do, I lead what I call a pastormind group. It's, it's 13 ministry leaders that come together and we want them to have a place where they can fully be themselves and share anything on their heart because two, they're going to be fully loved unconditionally, no matter what you're going through. And then number three, fully challenged. Because sometimes, like I'm a words of affirmation guy, like an inch, like yes. just high five me, give me a hug, tell me I'm awesome and I'm good. But sometimes I don't need a high five and a hug. Sometimes I need a slap in the face. Sure and we need challenge. So I think 
I had a mentor share when I was young. He said, I believe only about 2% of Christian leaders make it to their finish line intact, fulfilling the call of God in their life. And I think a lot of times it's just because they don't have a community that when they're struggling with something and we all struggle, they can actually share it with people. And we had a mentor come in and pour into our group and he said, guys, you, you, when you're struggling with something, you don't have to tell everyone, but you do have to tell someone. And the people you should tell are in this room. Why? Because they couldn't care less what you're struggling with. And, but it's because they couldn't care more. And if wow. leaders don't have that, then yeah, you're going to set yourself up for failure. Come on. Listen, he is a wealth of knowledge and wisdom. And be here. Stay here because we've got a whole lot more coming for you right after this break. God is doing a new thing. Be ready for it. With your best gift today, request Prophetic Reset, a powerful resource by prophetic leader and pastor Joshua Giles. You'll discover a 40-day journey unlike any other, one that will reposition you under God's powerful anointing, deepen your relationship with Him, and propel you forward. Through empowering scriptures, biblical insights, and prophetic tips, you'll discover how to reactivate your spiritual gifts and faith, release the old to seek Him anew, rest your mind in His counsel, and hear His wisdom for your next season. Even more, you'll witness His Word manifest in your life and return to His promises for you. Ask for Prophetic Reset when you give in support of Cornerstone Television today. Every gift helps us to spread the gospel through Christian programming. Call 888-665-4483 or give online at ctvn.org slash donate. Many of us feel like we are followers here, but we have Doug Smith, who is a leader of leaders. And Doug, the question for you is, how do I know when to lead and how do I know when to follow? Yeah, this is a huge question. Everything that is written is written about leadership. We should have a lot more books on followership because the reality is you can't be a great leader without being a great follower. And just because you're a leader doesn't mean you're not always following. Any leader, you always report to someone, right? You're <laughs> always following someone. And so, and at the end of the day, as children of God, we're ultimately following a master Come and on. someone that's over our whole life. And so we need to constantly be modeling what followership looks like to everyone, especially young leaders, because if they don't learn how to follow, they'll never be great leaders. You know, I also believe with that as well that uh, I've heard it said that, you know, it's the principles you learn while you're following are the ones that you'll implement mm. when yeah. you're leading. Come on. And That's so right. you have to first become a follower before you can ever really be the leader that God's called you to be. And I believe you only have authority because you're under Come authority. Yeah. So That's your right. authority only extends. Even the man that was uh, with Jairus' daughter, he said, mm. I am also a man. Mm under authority and I tell one to go and he goes and another to come and he comes. So I think it's very important that we have that as well. Yeah, so good, I love that. And prayer obviously as a leader is critical. When I think about our conversation with Terry and how her grandmother, yeah. you know, brought her into that prayer life and saw her dad who is <coughs> internationally changed the globe with the gospel of Jesus Christ, how prayer is so critical. And I just thank you, Doug. I thank you thank for what you. you're doing, how you're praying through, but you're also leading with the, by example. We honor you and pray blessings over your life. Right back Amen. at you both. Amen. Thank you so Amen. much. Today, we want you to be a follower of Jesus. And as you follow him, as he is in the spirit, watch him lead you into green pastures and watch as your life leads others into his goodness and his grace, out of darkness, into his marvelous light. Be blessed and we'll see you next time. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.